Hi there, welcome to this short lecture series on thyroid disease for third year medical students. My name is Dr. Pete Davis, I'm an endocrinologist based at Sandwell Hospital. Uh, I'm not sure whether you would have seen the lectures I prepared on endocrinology last sem semester, they're still available and I will share the link with you, but this is going to give you the lecture material that we'd normally be covering um, within a stand-up talk-at-you type of lecture. My intention is to flip the classroom for you to look at these three lectures um, ahead of our meeting towards the end of March. And then the time we have together, the plan is that uh, there'd be a fourth section that I publish uh, for you which is made up of extension questions. And the idea is that you prepare your answers to those extension questions, and they allow us to check your understanding when we get together face to face. So in this first uh, part of the series, we're going to cover everything relating to uh, the normal thyroid, which will expand in just a second. Uh, and if you'd like some further background information, uh, there are these two very nice links you can get from Wiki. So here we go. Okay, so uh, so this is what we're going to cover uh, in the first uh, part of the lecture series, anatomy, physiology, epidemiology, and uh, about the thyroid excess, as it's known. Here's what you need to know. The thyroid gland is naturally quite small and naturally quite vascular, and we normally don't see it or feel it in the neck. So if you can, you're already dealing with pathology, and that's in the, uh, in the next lecture. So iodide is trapped in the thyroid uh, by a process which is active. It's organified whereby it's added to substances made up of the amino acid tyrosine. So tyrosine, two tyrosines uh, come together to form thyronine, which then gets iodinated uh, by this uh, enzyme, the thyroid peroxidase. The products are uh, stored in colloid, and these iodinated compounds are bound to a much bigger molecule called thyroglobulin. The picture I show on the, uh, on the bottom right here is taken off one of the wiki sites, if you want to see that in greater detail. So how does all this happen? Well, it happens because the hormone thyroid stimulating hormone, which has a different name in America, uh, stimulates two aspects of the thyroid stimulates growth and it also stimulates function. And that's actually quite important when you consider different types of thyroid pathology later. It has both these functions. So here goes. Iodide enters the cell by active transport. The thyroid peroxidase system ends up with it being organified and put onto these uh, tyrosine uh, residues which come together to form these uh, thyronine uh, ele elements which either have four iodines or have three iodines depending on whether they're going to be a T4 or a T3 compound. And the full name for these uh, compounds are tetraiodothyronine or triiodothyronine, that's what T4 and T3 actually stand for. We know it, of course, as thyroxine, which I suppose is just the common name for tetraiodothyronine. So when the thyroid needs to secrete thyroid hormone, you get this pinching off of the, uh, of the colloid that's inside the thyroid follicular cell, and through the process of proteolysis, uh, thyroid hormones uh, are released into the circulation, predominantly T4, thyroxine, uh, with some T3. 
Another important aspect of thyroid physiology is to remember that only tiny amounts of thyroid hormones are free to act in the circulation. The vast majority are bound to specific binding proteins. Thyroid binding globulin and the other one is called transthyretin or the old name was thyroid binding prealbumin. Small amounts are, are actually bound to albumin in the circulation as well. So things such as uh, drugs that displace uh, elements which are bound to albumin can upset thyroid hormone levels sometimes. It's one of the ways in which thyroid hormone levels can be misleading in clinical circumstances. So when you see measurements of thyroid hormone, what you're getting is free T4 and free T3, which are these tiny elements of the total amount of hormone available in the circulation. And these are the forms of thyroid hormone which are free to act. The levels of thyroid hormone found in the circulation are extremely low. They are picomole per litre. So don't forget that's 10 to the minus 12. So we're talking about incredibly low levels of hormone. There, are, there is 10 times as much free T3 relative to free T4, but the absolute amounts of, of thyroid hormone are much lower for T3, much less T, free T3 or T3 is uh, secreted uh, by the thyroid uh, Free T4 is acting as a pro-hormone. So in order for thyroid hormone to work, T4 needs to be activated to T3. Uh, and that activation occurs with specific enzymes, which are most active in liver, kidney, and a little bit in the thyroid as well. Uh, and they are colloquially known as uh, iodinases, and the principal one is called type 1 deiodinase, or its abbreviation is uh, 1 deiodinase. As an aside, if you're interested in biochemistry, they really are quite interesting uh, enzymes. Two of the three have at their active site the element selenium. And there are very rare forms of, uh, of cretinism found in areas where humans are selenium deficient. Uh, and these are examples of uh, selenoproteins. Uh, and there are other examples other than uh, diiodinases, which are selenoproteins. So that will be a lovely extension task if this is an area of interest to you. Okay, so we've got some active hormone, T3. How is it going to work? Well, thyroid hormone is the sort of hormone that needs to enter the nucleus in order to work. It has a direct effect on nuclear transcription, and it does this through specific nuclear receptors. If you want to know more about this, again, it would form a very neat little extension tool if you would like. You may be asking yourself, why have a lecture on thyroid and thyroid disease as part of your third year curriculum? Well, I guess the answer is these are really quite common uh, problems. We estimate about one in seven uh, women will have uh, uh, some, uh, some version of goiter, either the thyroid's visible or palpable in the neck. Um, the prevalence of overactive thyroid is about one in 50 people. Uh, and the latest data on the prevalence of hypothyroidism are that uh, for your firm one work, there's about 3.5% prevalence uh, of people taking thyroid hormone replacement treatment in GP registers. And these are the incidence figures here from, uh, from a survey about 20 years ago now. When you did the endocrinology lecture last semester, uh, you looked at feedback loops and uh, when I gave the lecture I actually used the the, uh, the thyroid uh, access as uh, as a good example of this 
So the thyroid gland can only work when it's under direct positive stimulation from TSH, and we talked about how that affects not only the function but also the growth, but we'll come back to that uh, later on. And we've already talked about how uh, the principal secretory products uh, of the thyroid are, are shown there. Now, thyroid hormone itself is responsible for feeding back and switching off the production of TSH and of uh, a higher level of control TRH uh, from the hypothalamus. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that if, uh, if the t- thyroid hormone level starts to go too high, TSH is switched off uh, and the thyroid stops making thyroid hormone temporarily. If thyroid hormone level goes too low, this inhibition at the level of the, uh, of the pituitary and of the hypothalamus uh, uh, is overcome and TSH levels rise, correcting uh, the low levels of thyroid hormone. So the system self-regulates itself, a classical uh, negative feedback loop system. Not wishing to get ahead of ourselves in any way, but in thyroid pathologies, this system breaks down. And a really good word to consider when it comes to uh, system breakdowns in endocrinology, autonomous. Systems become autonomous. This means that the production of thyroid hormone within the thyroid gland happens without the need for for TSH stimulation. So the levels of thyroid hormone get higher and higher. That means that the TSH level gets lower and lower, and it should be fully suppressed, undetectable, unmeasurable in the context of thyrotoxicosis. If TSH levels are measurable in any way, it tends to mean that this is genuinely not thyrotoxicosis. And there's some other reason why the tests are, uh, are becoming unreliable and letting you down. The flip side is in, uh, in primary hypothyroidism. Uh, in this case, the thyroid gland is failing to make uh, thyroid hormone. I suppose you'd say it's the opposite of, of being autonomous. Usually it's an autoimmune process, so the effect of, uh, of inflammation within the thyroid stops the thyroid responding to TSH. As the level of thyroid hormone level falls, the, uh, the negative inhibition on TSH is released, so TSH levels uh, get high and indeed can be very high. They can be, uh, for example, uh, greater than 100 which, uh, believe me, is, uh, is very high in the context of, uh, of primary hypothyroidism. So I suppose that gives you a little bit of a taster for what's to come in the, in the next uh, instalment, Common Thyroid Pathologies. Thank you for listening. See you next time.